It's my pleasure to introduce to you Jay Want, uh, board certified in internal medicine uh, in private practice for 10 years. You may know him as having been the chief medical officer of CIVIC, the Center for Improving Value in Healthcare here in Colorado. Uh, I understand that tomorrow he'll be getting on an airplane uh, and uh, beginning his uh, new tenure as the executive director of the Peterson Center on Healthcare. Please join me in welcoming Jay Wan. So, um, I don't know how you felt about the morning, but uh, I thought that was amazing and fantastic, and I learned a ton of stuff. I found myself thinking, kind of sitting in the audience, man, that was great. I wonder who they have coming next. I mean, you know, so you got world-class social scientists, then world-class social, surely they have another world-class social scientist coming up next. No, actually. Uh, well, what about, you know, like a state, you know, well-known state guy who does social science? Well, actually not. All, all we actually have is Jay Wan. So, um, <laughs> so you know, so a, as a, a friend of ours said to the, her, her twins, when her mother, um, uh, her mother left after the twins were born, she turned to them and said, guys, level of service has just gone down. <laughs> so in any event, uh, so I don't, don't have nearly the insight, nor the uh, research background, nor the kind of academic chops basically to keep up with those guys. But they did ask me to come and talk a little bit about the Colorado APCD, health inequality and inequity, and how those things might mesh. So let's get to that. Okay, so I, um, you know, again, not being uh, a researcher in this area, I kind of went to the literature and basically pulled this up. You know, what is health inequality versus health inequity? Well, in this definition, uh, you know, even though they're only one syllable, syllable apart, they're actually pretty different. Health inequality basically is math, right? How much diabetes does your county have versus how much diabetes does your county have? Uh, these days, I gotta tell you, at uh, Civic uh, with the APCD, we rarely find anything at all that's equal within the state. I mean, basically finding exactly the same value for two geographic regions or demographic groups is really, really rare. So, so basically, health inequality is rampant throughout Colorado. Uh, important in this definition, though, is the last sentence, basically, which is absent from the definition of health inequality is any moral judgment on whether observed differences are fair or just. In contrast, health inequity or health disparity, which is a term I'm more familiar with, is a specific type of inequality. So you can envision the Venn diagram, inequalities here, inequities here, that denote an unjust difference in health. I, it's something we can take care of. It's something that we should take care of. And for whatever reason, we haven't done anything with that to this point. Former simply dimensional description, it's math, it's mapping. The latter is much more sophisticated. It's a judgment, basically, that, you know, stuff's unequal here, and it shouldn't be. It should be better than this. Well, what does the Colorado APC to have to say about that? Again, like I told you, you can't really turn around these days at Civic without running into a charter graph that somebody's made, which shows differences in health status or prevention or some other things um, in the database. This is from our old website. Our old website is actually down at this point. It's going to be coming back up um, and, in uh, Q4. So look for this close to the end of the year. But, uh, but the data is the, the same, actually. Uh, the, the new website and new vendor will have lots more data, lots more comparisons that look like this. And if you look at this, you know, it's pretty clear. So the, the green stuff out here is low prevalence of hypertension. The orange down here in the southeast corner is higher prevalence, you know, by a multiple, basically. Now, I had to look this up, because this, you know, if you look at this, this roughly parallels the continental divide. I had to look it up, because I don't, don't know this off the top of my head, but is altitude good or bad for hypertension? Uh, it turns out it's bad, right? I mean, there's studies from Tibet looking at this, people, you know, very high elevations where hypertension is actually more prevalent the higher you go. Somebody in the audience is nodding, so this is something, you know, they know, but I didn't know. But so anyway, this is not intuitive. Now immediately when I say, well, that's not what we expect, you start to think, well, you know, what are the theories about this? Well, you know, it's Mountain County, so maybe they're wealthier, so they have lower hypertension, or maybe they're more active. Everybody moved there to, to ski, like Manuel says, so maybe that's the case. Um, maybe it's, I don't know, that there's something in the water, basically, in the mountains, that, you know, some impurities that they don't get that we get. I mean, you can start to uh, spin all kinds of theories. Some of those theories you can actually test out in the APCD, some of those theories you cannot. But nonetheless, we can say, you know, without equivocation, that there's a lot of health inequality in the state of Colorado. 
we can actually slice and dice the da data a few other different ways in order to be able to, you know, kind of elucidate other stuff. So this actually, you know, you can, you can do the data, the half a billion claims that we have in the database, um, you can slice it by age, you can slice it by, um, by sex, um, you can actually slice it by insurer, that's one of the big divisions that we have. So when we actually look at, you know, simply, at, oops, sorry, let me go back here. When we look at basically, this is commercially insured, so this is most of you and me. Right? People get their insurance from their employer, and you can see, once again, disparities. We have kind of this you know, a lower prevalence area in the middle, and then as we get out to the rural counties and the periphery, there's a higher prevalence, uh, basically, uh, well, uh, well, actually, a lower rate of testing for uh, hemoglobin A1Cs for diabetes. There's routine testing basically to look at control of diabetes. So nothing uh, different from what I showed you in the last slide. This is interesting, though, but when we look at Medicaid, Medicaid's actually doing a slightly better job than commercial insurers are in actually doing appropriate testing for diabetics on a regular basis. Um, so we can now, what we've now demonstrated is that there's a differential, a health inequality between Medicaid and commercial in the state for this particular test. In this particular case, Medicaid is doing slightly better. It's another graph, actually, which shows breast cancer screening rates in which Medicaid doesn't do nearly as well. I have to caution, since I just saw Sue Birch, I'm pretty sure that you know, they're in the process of fixing this, or have fixed this by now, but, uh, but at least back in 2014, you see lots of rural counties where the screening mammography rate uh, for women of appropriate age um, is less than 40%, whereas in commercial, there's a difference, right? Most of this, is, this dark green area is 70% and greater. Uh, I think the lighter green is 60 to 70%. So this, again, is a health inequality. Now we're kind of getting somewhere, right? Because why should that be? I mean, I gave you all kinds of putative explanations for why hypertension varies in, this, in the state. But why should two women who live in exactly the same county have different likelihoods of getting an appropriate preventative measure because of what insurance they have? It doesn't make as much sense. Now again, you, you know, there are places here where you might think, oh, you know, rural access may not be as good, they may not have as many mammograms. Again, lots and lots of theories that you can spin in order to be able to try to explain this as an inequality without it actually being an inequity. Well, other things actually pop up in the database which um, have uh, maybe less to do with health status and more with actually what we spend, because it's a claims database, right? It's, it's financial. This is an interesting comparison between Medicaid and the total cost of care and commercial and total cost of care. This has come to light in our legislature recently. I, I saw some legislators in the audience, so they've probably seen this stuff before. But what this actually comparison shows is that even though you know, it's kind of eh, relatively even in Medicaid, in commercial there's kind of this glitch. Western Slope where people for the same level of sickness are paying about 50% more. You know, why is that? I don't know, you know, as, as we drill into this, we can say, well, they, they do actually use a little bit more stuff, but then prices are higher. Which one's actually the causative agent in making this, um, this uh, kind of dark orange versus lighter orange or even green over here? So this has been a matter of uh, pretty strong interest for the legislature and particularly for our lieutenant governor in terms of trying to figure out why this kind of disparity um, exists. Because it's not simply money, right? We're not operating with an infinite pool of dollars in the end, this might actually be access, right? If you can't buy insurance, this is a problem. Now, I was privileged to be a member of the Cost Commission, which just um, ended its work after three years, um, and I actually didn't attend the community meetings in Summit County and then in Mesa County, but the stories that my fellow commissioners brought back were, you know, it's pretty serious stuff. People were testifying that you know, my, my family's lived here for three generations. We have an identification here with place. And we're gonna have to move, you know, gonna have to basically move down to the front range because we can no longer afford to maintain our household here and to buy health insurance. You know, inequality, clearly. Inequity, you know, likely. And stuff that, that we uh, potentially could do something about. Well, what does the Colorado APCD actually have to say about inequity per se? Stuff that you know, we're pretty sure is correctable, fixable, and that we might put some effort into. Well, 
there's good news and there's bad news. Let me start with the bad news first. What I just showed you was a, just a few examples of where we might reasonably infer that there is an inequity as well as an inequality. But by and large, APCD is really good at telling you that there is an inequality, that the, the math is not absolutely equal between two groups. It's much harder for us to demonstrate inequity. That's the bad news. The good news is, is that I think we're about to enter um, a, a period of time, an age when this is going to be, uh, where things are going to open up quite a bit. And this is how I think that'll actually happen. This is 30-day all-cause readmission, which is a really wonky, nerdy term if you don't actually work in this area. But it's of intense interest for hospitals because they now get penalties from Medicare, basically, based on how high these rates are. And you can see that you know, we have kind of uh, you know, rel you know, more homogeneity in the center of the state. We have these a uh, couple of rural counties, uh, Jackson and Costilla, in which the rates are you know, probably about threefold what they are for the state average. Now, I want you to do kind of the Rorschach thing and kind of defocus your eyes here for a second and just look at that versus this. This is a graph that does not come from the APCD. This is a graph from a friend of mine, Jane Brock, who has done work with something called the ADI, the Area Deprivation Index. So Area Deprivation Index basically takes a lot of socioeconomic factors and rolls them all up. Roughly, it's, you know, how much stuff does your community have and how much, you know, are you relatively better off or worse off than the next census block um, cross? So it includes, you know, like completion of high school, um, graduation, percentage of people who do that. It includes, uh, do, you, uh, do you own or do you rent your house? It includes income, it includes the unemployment. All that kind of gets rolled up. This has actually been used in Europe for many years. Uh, for, uh, I think first in the Netherlands, but it's actually spread to other places. So again, do the Rorschach thing. Look at this and look at this. Jane's work says that these two graphs, if you do them nationally, correlate really, really well. Now think about that for a second. So is it hospital performance or is it the is the communities that they're embedded in. Jane would say that part of why, oops, let's go back, why these counties basically have different rates and why we see this kind of out in the rural areas versus the urban is that their relative area deprivation index is higher. This is the whole area of social determinants of health. So what I'm here to tell you, and I can do this for the first time in 10 years because I'm not associated with Civic anymore. This is a great resource, man. I mean, you know, this is, this is a place where you might be able to ask lots and lots of questions to fill in that blank between, my gosh, there's a status over here and this inequity or inequality over there. Are they related? And in fact, if they're related, what are the, what are the mechanisms? You know, because that's the important part is how do we get from people not having much stuff to them not getting good health care? and therefore not optimizing their opportunity to be exactly what they want to be, exactly what they to aspire to. That's the larger question that we have. And what I'm here to tell you is that I think uh, the state has this wonderful resource, uh, maybe the best APCD in the country, in order to be able to start to answer those questions. The APCD in and of itself just tells you about bills and costs and payments and that kind of stuff, and a few kind of proxy measures that we can get out of that um, through other elements that are in the claims data. But when you combine it with social factors, pattern recognition and the possibility for pattern recognition is huge. It's huge. The possibility for us to be able to dissect this, to understand this, to have the kind of inform, the kind of kind and the kind of uh, productive conversation that, that, uh, that Manuel and, uh, and Derek talk about goes way up. So I encourage you, basically, when this comes out in uh, you know, November or December, go there. Wander around. Basically, see what stuff is of interest to you and see how the APC might help you establish that causality so that we might establish which inequalities are actually inequities and that we might start to close the gap on those. Now, I don't have any Colorado-specific data beyond this, but I do have a little stuff that I showed you last year. This is the Raj Chetty stuff from about April of last year in which he looked at basically two big things, how much you make and how much how long you live, basically, uh, starting at, at age 40. What is your life expectancy? Now, I wish I'd talked to Manuel before and with Derek because, you know, if, if I could, it would have been great to find a study that actually correlates wealth, actually, with these same trends and these same uh, demographic uh, changes. But 
Chetty actually demonstrated a bunch of stuff, some of which you've already heard about this morning. So basically, this is income, rising income, this is rising life expectancy. And lo and behold, to almost nobody's surprise, if you make more money, you live longer. But there's other stuff in this graph that we ought to point out that we ought to try to understand a little better. Up here, I like to think of this collection of lines, which are very close together, to be encapsulated in the, in the term, being rich actually looks pretty much the same everywhere, right? In terms of your longevity, it doesn't seem to matter very much. You know, rich in Detroit, rich in New York, rich in San, San Francisco, not very different. Where it makes a big difference and where we might actually elevate the society as a whole is down here. This lowest quartile, basically, looking at Detroit versus New York versus San Francisco, San Francisco versus Dallas, there's a pretty substantial difference. This is a graph for men. This is a graph for women. Shapes of the graph are basically the same. So Chetty basically looked at, you know, basically tried to conclude from this. It's a big correlation study, basically. And this is the stuff that he concluded. First of all, life expectancy increases uh, continuously with income. And for, again, at the low end, the high end doesn't matter very much, but if you're in the lowest quartile, four and a half year difference in life expectancy at age 40 between the highest and lowest commuting zones or metropolitan areas. Perhaps most disturbingly among his big conclusions, gaps in life expectancy by income increased between 2001 and 2014. Not a misprint, it got worse, actually. Now, you know, again, maybe a little bit of good news, bad news things. So, so people's uh, life expectancy did rise during that time. So that's kind of a good news thing. Bad news, the people in the lowest quartile saw none of that gain. It all accrued to the wealthiest Americans. So but whatever mechanism actually mediates those things, it disproportionately is benefiting those who arguably have the least to worry about, right? People up here. What do we actually do in order to be able to close these gaps and make this gra graph uh, rise um, as a whole. That's the challenge before us, and it's really, really important work. Um, I'm gonna, just gonna skip through this because it's probably more detail than we need at this point, but he also tried to test the correlation between a bunch of other stuff, you know, prevailing theories. You know, maybe it's about getting people more medical care, analysis didn't support that, environmental differences, uh, adverse effects of income inequality, and labor market conditions. Now, he didn't disprove any of these theories with his correlation study, but he did demonstrate that he didn't have a strong support for any one of these particular theories. The one thing that he did find, though, in terms of what we might be able to do in order to be able to close those gaps is this. So most of the variation in life expectancy across areas was related to difference in health behaviors, including smoking, exercise, and obesity. In addition, individuals in the lowest income quartile have more healthful behaviors and live longer in areas with more immigrants, higher home values, and more college graduates. I am not here basically to you know, buy into some of those uh, you know, postmodernist theories that Derek talked about. This is not about individual responsibility, I don't think. I think this has to do with, these are intermediaries. These are mechanisms by which health is made worse for people. What causes this? What causes the increased stress? What causes us basically to cope in ways that our short term may be satisfying, but in long, on the long term, don't do us any favors? Those are the bigger questions, and those are the harder questions, and those are the reasons why the, uh, the work that Derek and Manuel are doing right now are so important. We can you know, continue to kind of pound on intermediate factors or you know, well maybe it's a simple theory about everybody just kind of bootstrapping themselves up or we can try to get to the root causes basically of why those disparities occur including disparities that are manifested in behavior. That's a takeaway I think I take from what Derek and Manuel have said and what Chetty has to say about this um, in the end. So um, uh, I'm going to New York tomorrow to start a new job um, on Monday. Um, but I wanted to take a moment basically to kind of, I guess, reinforce the theme um, here that you've seen this morning. Um, this has been a rare and wonderful place for me. You in many ways are my people. I feel understood and you know, a kinship with all of you that come on a regular basis and for, with those of you who have come for the first time. But early on in my tenure here, early on um, in the audience, uh, somebody turned to me and said, you know, this is the only conference I come to every year where, where people show charts and graphs and people cry. 
Now, that's mostly a credit to you, I mean, to the sophistication of the audience, but it also is a running theme, I think, basically with the foundation. Chetty used a billion and a half records in order to be able to come to his correlation conclusions, a billion and a half. You know, completely impossible with the computing power that was available, say, 20 years ago. That's not the point. The point is every one of those billion and a half data points was somebody. It was a family or it was an individual, it was a household of one type or another. And so um, in the spirit of the um, Health Foundation, um, I thought I would tell you why this matters to me as well. And I, and I will preface this again with, um, I saw Karen's slides and Alan's slides uh, for the first time when they put them up. So, uh, so we did not have a meeting in which we say this is uh, family picture day um, at, uh, at the foundation. But you know, thinking about the topic, you, know, you think about this and you, you start to think about family. This is important to me basically because of a little girl in the front row there, who is my mother. She got on a boat when she was 19 years old, leaving behind everything she knew and all what little material stuff that she had. Wasn't particularly sad to, to do that because the family she was living with was not particularly nice to her um, at that point, to come and marry my father. Landed at Angel Island after a three week a freighter voyage in which she couldn't eat the food because, well, to her, there was no food on the boat. I mean, because food is rice. Um, and none of the food, all was, except for, I, said, she, I think she said she had one meal where she had chicken rice soup and she was just overjoyed. Landed at Ada Jump Island, uh, weighing 86 pounds, took a three day train ride across the country um, in order to be able to uh, settle down with my father and a third floor walk up in Chinatown. Lived there for six or seven years. And for reasons that are still hard to understand sometimes for me today, settled in Fort Wayne, Indiana, <laughs> where I was born. So she kind of went up and down. You know, she, she, like everybody else, had kind of her, her uh, high points and her low points in her life. But at the end of the day, you know, she kind of matched some of the, the Chetty stuff. Doesn't smoke, doesn't drink. Um, uh, up until a few years ago, was walking four miles a day and uh, doing Tai Chi because somebody told her that those would be good for her. Until she ended up like this. So uh, this is her um, at, at Christmas last year. Um, and then about a month later, she turned 90. This is her niece, or I'm sorry, uh, my niece, her granddaughter. And this is her great granddaughter, Adelaide. My point in this is, again, not to buy into that kind of you know, positivist, bootstrappy thing uh, that Derek talks about, to say, well, you know, my mom did it, therefore anybody can. That's not the point, because it's not true. Not everybody can. Some people do play by the rules. Some people do the right things. And because of the way our system works, it doesn't work out for them. I have no illusions that all those behaviors actually carried my mother single-handedly to this point in her life. I believe she was lucky. I believe she was fortunate. And I think as a matter of policy and a matter of who we are as a nation, if we aspire to be a just nation, if we aspire to be an equitable nation, to the degree that it is within our control, we have to make that less a matter of a chance and more a matter of our structures, our policies, and who we are. And it's with that hope that I go to New York now to try to work on that a little bit more, and that I wish you all Godspeed, God bless, and continue to make Colorado you know, one of the greatest places on the planet. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>